Yeah, yeah. You are happy. Yeah. Good. <laughs> Johnny, welcome. Welcome to uh, H Hour. Absolute pleasure to have you in the alternative studio, the Bear Arm studio. Yes, thank you. Um, another another in a long line of guests via Keith Abram. And uh, however, the first, yeah, the first professor of psychopharmacology, I think. Oh. I think so. <laughs> Maybe the first professor. Possibly the first, but anyway, That's welcome. Cool. <laughs> welcome. <laughs> I'm excited. I'm excited because every time I get a guest via Keith, it's like I feel like I'm going to go take the next step into my depth of knowledge on the general subject of, well, psychology for one, mm -hmm. psychedelics for another, and uh, psychopharmacology now as well, um, which I find fascinating. And uh, I know a lot of listeners and viewers do too. So thank you. My first question psychopharmacology. 40 years you've been in that line of work, should we say, as a researcher, professor, lecturer, yeah? Yeah. What does that term entail? What's oh, the scope that's a great of it? question. Okay, so let's start with pharmacology. Um, and nothing to do with farming, as I've been asked. Um, <laughs> so simply, that is how drugs work in the body. So all drugs and, you know, common drugs that people would take, paracetamol, um, you know, aspirin, uh, and, and, you know, all kinds of things that we imbibe, alcohol, how does that work, um, illegal, legal <coughs> drugs, um, drugs for diabetes. So that's the simple uh, study of pharmacology. Uh, psychopharmacology is the drugs that affect the brain. So affect the, the brain function and behavior or the way you, you perceive the world. So that's all that psychopharmacology is really. And my interest has always been in uh, where the brain is altered, is in an altered state or um, kind of maybe uh, gets misfired or doesn't work right. And, but for me, it's all about how it influences behavior and that's really what psychiatry is it's the brain something happens to the brain maybe developmentally maybe for some other reason and behavior becomes disturbed or altered or just difficult to manage and then we need to seek help so thinking about anxiety or depression or substance misuse trauma well of course trauma leads to substance misuse leads to anxiety, depression, um, eating disorders, obsessive compulsive disorders. So psychiatry does cover a range of disorders. And what I've always actually focused on is drug discovery. So that's searching for better medicines for psychiatric illness. Okay. And that's generally done by pharmaceutical companies. So the reason I've been doing this so long is because the university that I went to, I went to Bath to study pharmacology. They didn't do a lot of um, CNS work, we call it, central nervous system, brain. But I, one of the, I mean, it, it was a great course, but one of the lovely things about Bath is that they give you a year's placement. And I ended up in Strasbourg in France working for a drug company for a year. And um, they, you know, there were a lot of different aspects of pharmacology I could have worked on but I wanted to work on behavior and the guy in charge of the behavioral unit was really excited because he said, nobody ever picks behavior. You know, it seems to be like the, um, I don't know, the poor, uh, the poor man's pharmacology. I don't know, but that, and, and I learned so much from working in that industry over the year, working with him and the team um, that I decided to do a PhD in the topic and then it just it just carried on from there. I wonder why it wasn't popular or isn't popular. It seems to me like it would be a very obvious thing you'd seem to want to get to know so about you, if you're looking at the impacts of drugs. I th well, brain. I suppose there's so many other... Behaviour. <laughs> Behaviour. Yeah. Well, for me, why would people not want to... That's I what mean, I mean. <laughs> to be fair, psychology is a very, um, a very, very popular science. Um, you know, university courses are absolutely full of people who want to, to understand the sort of the origins of behavior and understand why people do the things they do. But in terms of drug discovery, um, 
behavioural pharmacology just doesn't seem to be that. I, it takes quite a long time uh, studying the behaviour of animals. A bit of Attenborough, so that's what I've kind of always modelled my research on. It's studying the behaviour patterns of animals in their natural habitat, which is what Attenborough, I think, has always done so beautifully um, and has, has described and, and explained the behaviour of animals uh, in all his his programs. You mentioned him in the icebreaker as one of your inspirations. Did, yeah. Have you met him? Yeah. I haven't. Oh, no way. <laughs> Surely so there must be a way cruel. to get that done. And I know people who happened to be in a place <laughs> sitting beside him at dinner, one of my students. Oh, my you goodness know, me. Life is so unfair. <laughs> no, I've never met him. So if you're listening, uh, <laughs> Sir David. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, he's a regular listener. Hey, Chow. Yeah, yeah. Oh, he will be now. <laughs> <laughs> but he has been a massive sort of inspiration for all the animal modeling work that I've done over the years in, in looking for better treatments for, for psychiatric disorders. Okay. Was, was psychedelics on your radar back when you first started? Into never, that never. Actually, um, the, the system that psychedelics work on, so psychedelics work on a neurotransmitter system in the brain, 5-HT or serotonin, that I think many of your listeners have probably heard of. The classical antidepressants that, that you would be prescribed by your GP are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, so they increase the levels of serotonin in the brain. And serotonin controls many, um, you know, behaviours, many of our um, kind of can controls mood, it controls appetite, sexual behaviour, sleep, cognition, so learning and memory. So serotonin is, is very important in the brain for lots of our, our behaviours and uh, functions, um, but it's also the periphery, so the rest of the body is full of, of serotonin as well. Sorry, just to clarify, so all psychedelics, that's a neurotransmitter system they work on? Not all psychedelics, but thinking about um, psilocybin, so the active ingredient of magic mushrooms that many of your listeners probably have heard of and that grow all around us here, have probably been used, were used, I would say, probably by the Druids, have been used for, for many hundreds, if not thousands of years. Um, LSD, discovered by Albert Hoffman in 1938, while he was working for Sandoz, one of the bigger pharmaceutical companies in Switzerland. Very often in uh, drug discovery, so he was working in drug discovery as a chemist, um, we're looking for one thing and then find another. So Valium, that you're, you know, the anxiety, anti-anxiety drug, calm you down, um, help you sleep. Um, you know, that was discovered at Hoffman La Roche. People looking for one thing, fine. Noticed that when they gave animals, mainly, I mean, we use rats and mice generally in, in um, research, certainly in behavior. Uh, they noticed that the animals became very calm and sedated, if you like, and then they they continued to you know to investigate that, and then they marketed it as a kind of a, a sedative drug. Actually, it was it was targeted at hysterical housewives in those days. This was way back when in in the um, in the fifties. Um, yeah, so so very often that's what happens. You're looking for one thing, and and actually something else comes along. But going to go back to the the, um, the psychedelic. So ayahuasca, um, which um, is in, um, grows naturally in South America, in the Amazon, comes from the Banisteriopsis vine, uh, is this concoction uh, made into, into a brew. That also works on the serotonergic system. Um, some of the other sort of lesser known psychedelics don't, don't work on, on the serotonergic system, things like salvanor and I thought ayahuasca came from two or three different well, ayahuasca, species. Well, it does. So the active ingredient, the psychedelic in ayahuasca okay, okay, right. is DMT, which is dimethyl tryptamine. So serotonin is 5-hydroxytryptamine. So the structure is, is quite similar to serotonin. And, that, and, the, and the DMT comes from that vine? That's right. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. The, but DMT on its own, if you, because the tea is ingested or it's drunk, uh, that would, would be metabolized very quickly and would not enter the brain. So to, for DMT to enter the brain, you either have to be given intravenously or smoked, um, or it has to be taken with something that's going to stop 
the metabolism. And we call that a, a monoamine oxidase inhibitor. So it is found naturally in the Amazon. This vine contains both those, um, those um, constituents, the harmalines uh, and DMT, and that combines together to, for ayahuasca, to produce ayahuasca. And therefore, it will not be um, metabolized too quickly, and it will enter the body, and it will get into the brain. So that's interesting that that occurs naturally. So the, the, the very, one of the very interesting things about psychedelics is that they come from, many of them come from plants. If you think about peyote, mescaline comes from peyote. Um, ibogaine is also a plant. And, and of course, veering away from psychedelics, cannabis is a plant. So cannabinoids. So um, there will be a lot of other constituents in these plants that may confer medical um, benefits. You wouldn't classify cannabis from a cannabis plant in a, uh, as psychedelic with the cannabis THC component? No, yeah, that's a really good point actually, but it's not classically thought of as a, as a psychedelic. Oh, interesting. It can, of course, because not inducing an altered state of consciousness in quite the same way that psychedelics do. I mean, mind manifesting is the kind of definition of, of psychedelic. And I know that cannabis can induce, um, you know, certainly altered, altered state of mind, but it's not the same sort of consciousness altering property that something like LSD or psilocybin or um, mm. DMT ayahuasca will will have in the same level. Really, it's yeah. uh, ketamine. You know, we kind of could argue whether that's a psychedelic, and, and um, yeah, I would say on balance it is. MDMA ecstasy also considered to be a psychedelic. And that's another drug that works through the serotonergic system. So going back, so mm. what, what, what brought you professionally into psychedelics then? Was it when you went to Strasbourg? Oh, no, no, it was way, way beyond that. So why, why did you get interested? What, what drew you? Okay, so just to go back to Strasbourg then, quite interesting because that was, um, that was 40 years ago when I was still a student. And I was working on the serotonin system, which is how psychedelics work. Um, and that company were looking for better drugs for anxiety. And actually, we still haven't come all that far um, in, that, in developing better drugs for that. Um, and so that's the project I was put on, and that was working on, on serotonin drugs. At that point, and this is how this sort of the, uh, neuroscience has, has evolved, I think there were something like three known 5-HT receptors. Um, now we know that there are seven receptors, but 19 subtypes. So that field has, has expanded massively. And it's interesting for me to look back and to think the kind of the tools that we had to work with were very blunt compared to the tools that we have now. Um, so I, um, PhD, psychopharmacology, studying behavior, studied serotonin again, its control in appetite. Uh, not just working on basic basic mechanisms, not looking for drugs at that point. Then going in to do postdoc, worked with an ethologist, <coughs> looking for, and then again, the funding for that post came from uh, Merck Sharp and Dome, and they were looking for better drugs for um, panic and anxiety. So back to, to anxiety, working on a different system. Then getting my first academic position and working on substance misuse, Again, that was funded by a drug company, funded by GSK. They were actually looking to develop the models around um, what substance misuse on craving. And I chose to work on alcohol. That was very interesting, encouraging rats to drink alcohol and then studying what, once they, once you could get over the barriers of them uh, ingesting alcohol, which doesn't taste very good to them. Uh, but actually animals will learn to like the taste of, um, of substances that you put in with alcohol. So if you can flavor alcohol with different different flavors, they learn to like the taste of that because of what the alcohol does for them, which is exactly what happens in people. Mm. Because if you think of it back to being a teenager, drinking beer, wine, disgusting. And we tend to drink things like vodka when we're younger, <coughs> put a load of lime. That's certainly what we did in Belfast in the old days. Probably shared a vodka and lime between three of us. 
um, you know, you, you, you have to mask the, the disgusting flavor of alcohol. But then you come to learn to love the flavors associated with alcohol because of what alcohol does for you. Mm. So, you know, there's a lots, of, um, lots of paradigms you can use in animals that actually relate to what happens in people. So I then uh, worked at Bradford University. They were, had the biggest spin out of any UK university in the, in the 1980s, delivering drugs, very, very pure particles of drugs into the body, uh, Bradford particle design it was called. So Bradford had a really good history of working with industry. And that's what I started to do when I worked there. Um, and we set up what we call a CRO, a contract research organization. And that was, developing the models in the animals to test new drugs for psychiatric disorders. So if you think about brain is disturbed and behavior gets disturbed, so that's what we did in the animals. Um, we used um, a particular psychoactive drug to change the brain in a subtle way in the animals and that changed their behavior. Uh, and I took that uh, company to, we never spun it out though, and I'm very grateful we didn't, um, to Manchester and then worked with all different pharma companies that you could you could probably imagine or name, all the big ones, lots of small ones, testing their drugs to improve cognitive ability um, in this, this animal model. And in all that time, um, and all the, the work that we did, all the brilliant molecules that we worked on, we never got a drug into patients that made a difference to patient well-being. So we'd, we'd work on a lot of great mechanisms, really clever science, but nothing ever got into patients that, that was a new mechanism or that really made a big difference to patients. Mm. You know, and, and I've, I've watched this um, throughout my career. So many drugs fail in phase three. So these are the very large clinical trials where you over um, multiple sites, the results were quite good in a small population in phase two. They get to phase three and, and they fail and they, they just, they get, you know, binned. And that costs the drug companies a load of money. That can cost a billion dollars to run a big phase three trial. So why, what, is, why is it not, you know, to identify earlier on in phase one or phase two that it's not going to work in a bigger, the indications of phase two must have been that, must yes. often be that it's oh, going to work in yeah, phase three. Absolutely. Then. So what's absolutely. the difference? It's just a bigger population size, It's right? a much bigger population size. Um, I think the trials very often are not designed very well. They're very restrictive um, for the regulators. So you have to see a, a big separation from the placebo control. Um, there's usually one outcome measure. So one measurement that's probably a questionnaire um, mm. and, and not taking into account all the different outcome measures and all the other benefits. And because the pharma companies have such strict regulations that they cannot pursue that molecule, or if one person has a bad effect, they have to bin it. I, mm. um, people can kind of been working for 30 years on a project and then, and then it fails at this stage. It's heartbreaking. But for psychiatry in particular, Big Pharma pulled out of that area about 15 years ago. So far too expensive, far too many failures, far too difficult, because I think there are, are few clear um, targets to, to engage with, because a lot of your, your change in behavior comes through a, a sort of process of having experienced trauma in childhood, and none of that's really taken into account in, in the kind of um, the development of the drugs, very difficult to develop these. And there's been no innovation since the, um, the development of the serotonergic antidepressants, which most of us are familiar SS with, the SSRIs. Oh, right, yeah. um, no real innovation <coughs> in 50 years. So I, um, well, moved to Manchester University. We have a policy unit. So their aim is to um, enable academics work to change policy. Um, and we are third go core goal is social responsibility. And I, I kind of thought, well, where is the where's the real responsibility in what I'm doing? You know, it, it's science, it's improving knowledge. But in terms of patients, the responsibility to patients, 
where have we got? And my answer really, as you get older, you kind of reflect on, on, I guess, your work and its meaning. And I thought, it just isn't there. It hasn't. You know, it hasn't done what I thought we would do, you know, when I was uh, 21 working in Strasbourg. Uh, I really believed that we would develop, we would revolutionise psychiatry through the kind of work that, that we were all doing. And it just hasn't happened. However, that's where psychedelics come in. So they are... Hasn't happened yet. I, well, yeah, it hasn't happened yet, but it actually <laughs> has for some people. And that's, that's another thing that drew me into this. Okay. So huge phase three trials, a drug that could have worked for many people just never got through. And that's heartbreaking. And, and to see the lives of patients, <clears throat> you know, people with treatment resistant depression, people with PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, people with substance misuse, alcoholism, you know, addiction to a variety of, of, of um, drugs. You know, we've all met people who've died through alcoholism or through, through drug overdoses. Um, so I also got very interested in drug policy and the, um, the cruelty of making illegal drugs or make, sorry, making um, psychoactive drugs illegal and the nonsense of that and the harms that that have caused. And when the, did it happen? Uh, 1971, Misuse of Drugs Act Why in did the it UK. So I think it probably happened partly because of psychedelics. So psychedelics go way back when. 1938, Hoffman discovers LSD, synthesizes it in the lab. A couple of years later, tries it himself. He's working for Sandoz, big pharmaceutical company. He realizes the enormous potential of a drug, a mind-altering substance like this, but he doesn't know what for. So Sandoz <coughs> distribute the drug to psychologists, psychiatrists, psychotherapists, um, and, and clinical trials do happen because it's not an illegal drug in those days. Um, and the results are extraordinary for people with um, the anxiety and depression that occurs with having a terminal diagnosis. It was quite a lot of work done on that in the old days. Um, and this is kind of in the 50s and 60s. A lot of work done on substance misuse. Humphrey Osman famously, um, who went to work in the States, um, he treated 2,000 people with alcohol use disorder, so alcoholics, with LSD, and he got a 40% abstinence rate. Alcoholics Anonymous rate is 7%. So there's enormous... Is, it? is that all it is? It's, that's all it is. Because it's, it's based on a principle that many people really don't want to follow, you know, the, the higher being, if you like, um, control. 40% um, is huge. It's massive. Mm. And other psychedelics, when they came along, psilocybin, he synthesized psilocybin in 1958 started that started then studies started to be you, you're saying synthesized so he created his own version of the lab without having to get it from a plant well lsd lsd never came actually LSD, I'm talking oh about. psilocybin yeah, yeah, sorry yeah. that's right okay. so he created his own version he's synth chemist very talented chemist so have, having synthesized lsd way back when he then well did he extract it from the plant or did he synthesize it actually that's a good point it's possible that he extracted it from the plant. Either way, it's, it's clever stuff. It's very, mm. very clever science. And of course, MDMA, ecstasy, was um, synthesized. So that's another synthetic um, psychedelic. It was synthesized um, in a laboratory way, back, way before LSD. That was synthesized in something like 1914. Uh, they were looking for treatment for blood disorders and synthesized MDMA, ecstasy, um, and that got put on the shelf because it had, had some effects that they weren't looking for, but it did get resurrected um, and actually was called empathy uh, back in the day. So that then was, um, I can't quite remember, but that was uh, again, somebody working in a pharmaceutical company uh, saw that this could be very, very useful and it started to be used in clinical practice, psychotherapy. So why did they get, these things get made illegal in the UK? 
kind so sense. counterculture revolution lsd is not illegal um people are using it and kind of across the states mind-altering substance connectedness to nature empathy connectedness to other people the americans are fighting a war in vietnam timothy leary is suggesting that everybody should take lsd um oh, the, that, uh, tune in to uh tune in turn on drop out that's it, that yeah. it yeah something like that so yeah, yeah. the last thing the american administration and of course the cia famously used have LSD. you read chaos I, oh, I oh, don't think so. Oh my <laughs> God, you've got to read this book. You've got to read Chaos. It's all about Charles Manson. And oh. it's all about LSD. Oh, it brilliant. Is, it is an incredible book. Tr all thir 20, 20 years of research by um, a journalist who became an investigator. All st uh, sorry, to sorry to segue onto this. He was asked to do a story in 99 on the 30th anniversary of the Manson murders. I do a little thing on on the murders 30 years later and then starts looking at it and he says this I, this isn't a this isn't like a short article this is i've discovered some stuff here which isn't adding up yeah 20 years later and he released this book called chaos last year the year before it's about that it is i'm i'll give you a copy i'll give you a copy Ooh, dude, it is yeah. incredible <laughs> cia lsd manson counterculture everything in the states it is wild you won't believe it you won't believe it. each chapter i get through and go that can't be real can't be real what they were doing yeah yeah anyway right well, listeners listen to that great so that's chaos. I'll give, yeah i'll, get, I'll get you yeah um love that sorry for jumping in there no 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 so i mean that's <laughs> brought it yeah well that's kind of brought us back to the to the states and the situation the political situation um so they shut it down basically i mean so, you know it, it is a very intense psychological you talk to anyone who's taken uh lsd very intense psychological um, experience. For sure, some people take it who should never have gone near it, had a very bad um, experience. You know, quite a lot of those kind of hippie groups in the 60s, Sid Barrett, for example, some of those LSD's people acid, took right? too much. LSD's acid, yeah. yeah, yeah. Took it, liked it, took more, took more, you know, and that's, you know, in pharmacology, it's all about the dose. S start low, if you've never taken a drug before, you need to know how it's going to affect you what for whatever it is whether it's brain or periphery or you know blood pressure whatever it is so you start low you go slow and you don't up the dose quickly but people just did did a lot an awful lot of acid in the 60s and some people like that got sort of embedded in that culture that they needed to do more and more for more and more enlightenment and and that clearly for some people did them a lot of doubt. It's very sad because people like Sid Barrett never recovered. And genius. I, in, yeah, yeah, interesting you mentioned him. I mean, people, most people listening to this probably don't know who Sid Barrett is. I'm, I'm a massive Floyd fan, but that was very, oh, but the, the, yeah. the, the, it was, and they argue that was part of his genius, wasn't it? When he was, when he was with the band. Yeah. But obviously it was a very, very fast downfall for him. He, he, he died, I think He not died long ago, relatively recently. 2006, was it yeah. not? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Lived yeah. with his mum all his life after that's right after yeah what happened. in uh in uh Grand, cambridge Grand, yeah, yeah grandchester yeah. is that a cambridge way i think it is yeah yeah, yeah it is no yeah. it is cambridge way. Um, really sad and so many other um you know famous people that, that kind of got really hooked up on this so that um, led to it getting binned by the government so they um yeah so the americans banned it and persuaded the um, United Nations to ban it. So we got caught up in all, the British weren't interested in illegal drugs. Um, I mean, the British weren't really, in, didn't really have a big drug problem in those days. You know, people use drugs, smoke cannabis. There was not, not the, um, nothing like the situation in the States. And the British cops were not rewarded for arresting people for drugs. So it just, I know some of them, you know, they were illegal at that time, but it wasn't a big deal. But UN Convention, we got drawn into that. Our Misuse of Drugs Act, 1971, that's over 50 years ago, banned all these drugs, illegal, massive fines, sentences, prison sentences for people caught using drugs, illegal drugs that, you know, were not illegal before that. Um, huge prison sentences for um, 
possession, supply, <coughs> imprisoned, and you know, the drug laws, the book to read on this is Chasing the Scream by Johann Harry, so we really understand where our drug laws came from, banning opium, opium used by Chinese people, calling uh, cannabis marijuana, um, you know, um, marginalizing Mexican black communities. So the drug, our drug laws are racist and have come from racism. And that's beautifully explained in that book, Chasing the Scream. Chasing the Scream. Chasing the Scream. Yeah. It's Johan Harry who speaks so beautifully oh, wow. about these topics. I'll write that down. Okay. Um, and again, you know, a bit like your chaos book, you would not believe some of the things that went on and Harry Anslinger um, looking for work uh, after Prohibition, actually. And look what happened when they banned alcohol in uh, the States in the 30s. So many people died because they were using, you know, illegal sources. And that's exactly what's happened with our drug laws. You know, you, you know, so it's so, has caused so many deaths. Yeah, making drugs illegal and fear and stigma, and that's what happened to psychedelics alongside all the other drugs. But psychedelics, more than than others, really, have been massively stigmatized by the media because of their, um, you know, because they do have this psychological um, intense psychological mind altering properties. Um, but the psychedelic renaissance is here, thankfully, because as I said, um, we are in dire straits with the mental health of our nation, of our world. The pandemic did not help this. Um, severe mental illness causes the economy, billions in this country every year. People die of suicide. You know, 20, is it 20 combat veterans a day in the, in the States commit suicide. Um, it's, it's very common. You read about it in the press all the time. Students commit suicide. People need an alternative approach to treating their mental health. Um, and, and psychedelics will do this. Is it, can I ask a question on the, on the suicide rates in the UK mm -hmm. anyway? Mm -hmm. Is it... Is there firm evidence to say that suicides have gone up in the last absolutely. five, ten years? Yeah, there is, absolutely. is that? I, I'm just asking. Yeah, okay. and in the pandemic, suicide okay, rates went, went through the roof. As you can imagine, loneliness and how How, big, um, how, how and much fear. of an increase are we talking? Well, your, next, your guest next week is Simon Ruffle. Yeah. And um, when I talked to him at Christmas of the pandemic, um, he said he'd seen 17 in the last two weeks. So I, yeah, yeah. Seen where? Um, well, he's a psychiatrist, so he'd, he'd oh. been, he'd been, um, Jesus, you know, patients is patients or, or patients of colleagues. Mm. So I don't have the stats actually. I think I'll Simon next week, but okay. but went th absolutely through the roof in the pandemic, and has not really stabilised either now. So the people struggling with their mental health in this country, with no real um, hope. And people who have tried everything. So, you mentioned the psychedelic renaissance, yeah. and uh, I've, I've spoken with Keith, and I've spoken with um, uh, a gentleman called Neil Woods in the past. Over oh, the, yeah. The, oh, you know Neil? I do okay, know Neil. Okay, cool, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, so he changed my mind on the legalisation of drugs, oh, completely yeah. switched it. In the space of an hour and a half, right? Um, so the, the legal aspect I'm well versed on, the, the, the reasons for legalising drugs, right? Mm -hmm. Now, from the science aspect, your, your expertise here. What's what? What is your? What? Where do you think the most promise lies? In and in what substances and, and why? What is getting you excited at the minute? Yeah. Okay. Just um, about Neil Woods. Yeah. He's the reason I got interested in drug policy. Okay. I'm absolutely honest. Driving home from work Friday night, I hear Neil Woods interviewed by Eddie Mayer, Radio Four. Absolutely. He is so bang on the money. And because he was a cop, undercover cop, working um, you know, with illegal drugs, with organised crime, um, <coughs> he understands it better than anybody, I think, the harm that our drug laws have done. Uh, I contacted David Nutt that night. I said, do you know Neil? He said, oh yeah, yeah, his work is amazing. I thought, okay, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to work 
to help people um, who have, uh, you know, been marginalised or harmed by our drug laws. What can I do? Um, okay, I've worked in drug discovery all these years. Come nowhere. Psychedelics are the thing. So that's really it's Neil Woods and David Nutt that I ended up working on psychedelics. Okay, so the four and the reason that they, I believe, <coughs> they will revolutionise psychiatry uh, is that they work. So that's got a long story. That helps. They work, not for everybody. <laughs> it's but, a good start. <laughs> <laughs> and I've met so many people who who've been healed. So that's the word for me is that they heal people. So if you think about how we treat mental health, we prescribe a medication like a an antidepressant or an antipsychotic or an anticonvulsant or whatever it is. And that's a medication that somebody has to take every day. So there's an enormous side effect burden of that medicine. And, and these drugs do have massive side effects that people have to kind of learn to live with. So, but they do not heal you. They help you manage your illness. They help to manage your symptoms, your extreme anxiety, your, your um, severe depression. But they don't heal you and they don't enable you to, um, I don't know, engage with yourself in a way or your past and your trauma in a way that enables you to heal. So that for me is absolutely extraordinary and it's kind of something that I hadn't really encountered before. I mean, people do get better from mental health conditions, don't get me wrong, but in general, that's what we're doing. So this is, okay, a complete paradigm shift because we're healing people. The way in which these drugs are used, uh, either in a retreat or clinically, is a game changer as well. That's another paradigm shift. So we're talking about a once dose, maybe a once in a lifetime dose, a reasonably high dose, mind altering dose for sure. Maybe for some of the clinical paradigms, maybe two doses, maybe three doses, I don't know, six, three or six weeks apart. And don't forget it's psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. So the therapy that accompanies this, particularly um, the after, um, the, the therapy that you will receive making sense of the experience, the integration, we call it, that's absolutely essential. And, and the setting. So you have to be in the right mindset to accept the experience that the psychedelic is going to, going to do for you. Why do you call it the integration? Because you, you're integrating the experience that you've, you've had kind of <coughs> with your, how you feel now with your sort of your life and how you're going to move on because it's been there it's such a, a kind of life-changing experience that it can be very difficult then to take that oops to take that forward into your um subsequent kind of existence your your your, your life as it is because really a lot about that life will change as a result of this this experience it really is a life-changing experience so that is a paradigm shift and to have something that you experience once and you never, some people never need to do it again. So one of the other reasons I got into this was meeting a combat veteran, a friend of my daughter's. So she was working down in Dorset um, for the National Trust and one of the, uh, the nighttime rangers who tend to be kind of tough guys was a former paratrooper. And she said the first year she worked there, he was very uh, distant and they all thought he was sort of above them and a bit snooty really, didn't really want to associate with kind of the young kids, if you like, he was a little bit older. She said when she went back the next summer, he was completely different. She couldn't get over the, the transformation in him. He was chatty, he was friendly, he was funny. And she got talking to him about the work that I was doing and I was, because I'd taken a sabbatical to learn as much as I could about psychedelic medicine. And um, he told her his story, that he had suffered severe trauma when he came out of the military and he had, you know, stopped sleeping, hypervigilant, not really able to function. Uh, and the year before he'd been struggling with, with his PTSD. Um, and he learned about psychedelics 
from the American military, because many of those guys had, had been using psychedelics. And he took himself to Holland with his girlfriend and did uh, psilocybin truffles uh, in a hotel room on his own. Well, just with his girlfriend for company, took two high doses over a weekend and came out well. He said he went sightseeing on the Monday. He said he could never have been in big crowds before that. Um, and that's, uh, that was such an extraordinary story. So I'm, that was in January 2018. I'm 2019 sorry I met him in August he was still well he hadn't he hadn't had any integration he hadn't had any he prepared himself very very carefully I think by learning as much as he could uh, and that's kind of not the normal scenario um, but he and I, I've been in touch with him since now 2024 um, and he's now doing medicine uh, so you know I, I yeah. Studying. Uh, studying, yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. He's probably now in his third year of medical school uh, and came out of the military with no qualifications. So he, I was so struck by this story and I asked him what he wanted to see happen. And he said he would like to see the military offering psilocybin assisted therapy to uh, anybody struggling with their mental health before they leave the military to get that support and to get that, have access to that healing. So. Okay, so, so that's an example of somebody who only ever used it on one occasion and has not needed to go back there. And he said his happy place is going back in his mind to the experience he had when he was, um, when he had the, the trip with psilocybin. Extraordinary story. And of course, Keith Abraham's story is absolutely extraordinary as well. So there we are, once or twice daily, uh, you know, once or twice treatments, and you're he you can be healed, you have the potential to be healed. You have the sort of mind has been opened to, and, and kind of your mindset um, has been changed. The, uh, so, so related to that, another extraordinary aspect is how long lasting the effects of psychedelics are. And that's probably because of neuroplasticity. So they do, uh, the way they work in the brain is to enable new connections in the brain, new um, circuitry actually to form that that remains. So you're actually rewiring your brain where it has become maladapted, maladjusted. Your brain has been kind of opened by these, um, I mean, just remarkable um, medicines plant medicines really and that that is long lasting so so you've kind of been able to have a long lasting change to your brain and therefore to to your your mental health and your your behavior and your well-being and the fourth thing about psychedelics that people uh people so there is there was a lot of stigma and people were very feared of them i think it's important to respect them they're remarkably safe pharmacologically. So you couldn't kill yourself overdosing on LSD, for example. Um, you know, you would probably have an extremely intense psychological experience, but physiologically, you know, they're not like opiates that are going to stop your breathing. You know, you can easily overdose on, on quite a lot of, of drugs, but your pure psychedelics, it would be pretty hard going. Um, because of their pharmacology, because you know they um, they do not kind of uh, stop any of your vital um, organs from functioning the way other drugs um, can, you know, cocaine, other drugs can do that to your vital organs. Um, I mean, Hoffman lived to be 102, and he took um, took LSD. Um, so at uh, he was a daily user, was he not? Well, I'm not sure how often, he, I mean, you couldn't really be a daily user because the effects, uh, because of the pharmacology and because of the, the um, well, the receptor, we call it, so that's part of the cell membrane, that the drug interacts with the receptor site in the body or in the brain and connects with that and then causes a cascade of events or e physiological effects. So. And that receptor actually is um, will not be responsive to the drug for a couple of days. That's why when people microdose, after you've taken it, yeah, after right. you've taken it. So when people microdose, That's what I was going to ask, yeah. they they don't take it every day. There's no point because it won't have the effects 
the next day. So you have to wait a couple of days for the system to kind of reboot or to... Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, that's the pharmacology. And actually oh. nicotine is similar. So the only high you really get from your nicotine is the first fag of the day. I don't know if you've ever been a smoker, but the first, oh, oh, great. You know, the first, that, that, yeah, not, you know, bad drug, of course. But, but as a former uh, yeah. smoker, you know, I vividly remember the great feeling that that gives you first cigarette of the day. But actually all the rest of your nicotine during the rest of the day, because of what's happened to the, the nicotine receptor, is actually internalized. So it's not available to the nicotine in the same way. It's just maintaining your plasma levels of nicotine throughout the day. And then you sleep and that allows your system to recover. Next first cigarette of the morning, oh, you get that effect again. So I was at some point in the past in a country where it's allowed, I was microdosing. Oh yeah. Uh, psilocybin. Yeah. And the instructions there was, it was every day. I think, oh. I think it was four days on and maybe two or three off or maybe two yeah. off maybe and now I'm thinking really is that the right instructions or do you just want me to have them quicker so I'd be a more regular buyer and look at that again interesting okay anyway that's it. I yeah. think yeah the advice probably or when people do use them correctly is probably once every other day or every third day for mm. I might be misremembering it I didn't I, I I didn't find it that beneficial. Um, and I know someone else who, who tried it. I said that beneficial. I didn't notice anything. I said, okay. Yeah. I thought I thought for the first few days, yeah, this is yeah. great. But I thought maybe it's a placebo. I took it for about a month. Yeah. But, no, not, there's nothing noticeable here. But what I am noticing, which is not psychedelic, is CBD. Real, real noticeable. And of course, but, folks, like, CBD is fully legal. Yeah, fully legal. But the, the, the doses they sell in the shops are really low. Terrible. So I was, for about six months, I was taking, we are digressing here, sorry. But it, it's a bit of information I do want to get across to people. The, the dose I was getting in the shop was maybe five milligrams in a tablet. Rubbish. It was nothing. And I've, I've, I'm taking five times that now. So 25 milligrams a day, just in the, in the capsule that you got online. On Amazon, I think I got it. Because the only place I could get five, a high, not a high dose, relatively high dose, 25 milligrams, noticeable. So calmer not that i'm erratic but i'm definitely calmer and my anxiety is lower but uh, no my incidence of elevated anxiety where i think i'm feeling anxious and not non-existent interestingly anyway uh not a cbd which is not i also of love today. cbd okay i think it's great and i can uh, uh, cbd brothers online brilliant cbd brothers brothers online okay yeah, fantastic right. gummies or oil or i mean there's loads of different places you can get it i also like cbd and i <clears throat> yeah tend towards anxiety as well and it does help me calms me down yeah i i think cbd is fantastic and also in another country where it was legal have microdosed psilocybin same um, for the first couple of days, I thought, this is amazing. I feel so much better. But actually, after a month, I thought, I'm not really sure that it's mm. having such a big effect. Um, I like lots of psilocybin. <laughs> <laughs> At the same time. <laughs> I got no problem with that. <laughs> Macrodosing. <laughs> And in terms of therapy, <laughs> macrodoses are clearly in a controlled environment. In a controlled environment. In another country where it's like. <laughs> anyway. Anyway, we digress. But um, well, but the the science of microdosing is very interesting. And for you know, for your listeners who are who are interested or, or you know are thinking of. Um, <clears throat> anyway. Uh, I, th I would say the jury is out. You talk to a lot of people, they, they clearly feel that they have had a, a big benefit. Um, but From what? From what? From microdosing oh, yeah, yeah, psilocybin, yeah. Um, which is great. You know, I, I think that's, that's very encouraging. Uh, and some of the studies have shown an effect. Now, the most recent work I saw from David Arizzo, who's amalgamated all the trials available, um, is that there is a pharmacological interaction. So it's not homeopathy. You know, the, the receptors are being occupied by psilocybin. Homeopathy? To, uh, where you're taking nothing. Oh, okay. Yeah, you know, or it's so diluted, it cannot be. Okay. It cannot be a pharma, you know, upsetting all the homeopaths out there. 
but it, you know it, it um, cannot be a pharmacological effect a drug having an effect on the body it just cannot be because there's nothing in it or it's so dilute there cannot be anything in it but um, that's sort of traditional homeopathy but so there is with the microdosing he was with the PET imaging so you can look into the brain and see where the drug is sitting and if the drug is getting in and if it's in the right place so there is that pharmacological interaction but whatever <coughs> it is whatever the outcome measures are when he collapsed all the data together really effects on mood we're not there so i think the jury is still out and we have a lot of work to do and the blinding of these studies is so important because the expectation effect that people have with psychedelics is, is big. There are clever ways you can kind of minimize that in clinical trials, which have been done um, very nicely. Can you give any examples of that? How of how they've, yeah. Well, explain what the blinding is for people. So, yeah, so. so in any trial for any new medicine, you will not know, you will not know what you're taking and the person, the clinician, <coughs> will not know what they're giving you. So that's called either double be, blinding, That's right? double blinding. Okay. So, because it's important that the clinician does not know either because they can kind of subconsciously, and that's the great thing about doing animal studies, folks. Animals don't know what they're getting, so you don't need to blind them. Um, but even if the experimenter knows, so we tend to blind our experimenters in animal studies. Because subtle, very subtle, um, you know, changes in your tone or your behavior might indicate to the patient that they're either getting a placebo so you know something that's inert or they're getting the active drug and but that is very difficult to do with a psychedelic <coughs> because high dose of a psychedelic you certainly going to know that you're getting it however there have been situations where people have uh, in trials very low dose like one milligram of psilocybin is a very low dose or compared to 25 milligrams so that is that is one way of minimizing the expectation. So everybody's going to get psilocybin. And that was the clever thing that the Compass Pathways trial for, for treatment-resistant depression, um, that's what they did. So they would one milligram, which technically is, such a, is like a microdose, 10 milligrams, which are medium dose, and 25 milligrams, which was their active dose. That's really the, the dose that they were most interested in or they hypothesized would have the biggest effect. And of course it did. So that's kind of one way of getting over the blinding. You can use, you know, something like Ritalin that is a psychoactive legal drug that will certainly have change, you know, your, your mental state, your mood, um, but not in the same way as a psychedelic. So niacin, so there've been quite a lot of attempts to, to use something that is not, will have a psychoactive effect um, so that people don't kind of know exactly whether they've got the active or, or something that's not going to, you know, not going to kind of work. Um, and there have been other sort of clever ways of, of tell, you know, people will always get the drug at some point in the trial, but they're sort of staggering when people get the drug and when they get placebo. It's tough stuff. And, um, so is, is psilocybin your focus now? Psilocybin is the focus of most clinical trials. Um, I think because the half-life is, it's a lot shorter half-life, so that's the amount of time that the, the body will take to metabolize half <coughs> the amount of, of the substance. Uh, and that's a kind of standard medical um, way of, of assessing how long the drug is in the body for. Why do they use half-life and not just full life? Uh, well, yeah, you probably have to ask somebody better than me. Uh, I mean, it is, it is complicated. But I suppose because half, when you've got half the drug, you've experienced most of the big effects that the drug is going to give you. And okay. then it's on its way out. I think okay. that's why. Uh, because it takes a lot longer for lots of drugs to be completely cleared by the body. Cannabis takes a month or something. It takes forever. Um, so it's, it's a lot shorter acting than LSD. So that was, and it's relatively easy to make, to synthesize in the laboratory. Um, it's a natural product. So many people prefer to have something that comes from a plant <coughs> as opposed to something that's been made in a lab, even though 
probably what they're getting has been made in a lab. But it's, you know, it's a plant medicine, if you like. To my mind, DMT, intravenously administered or delivered in a way that will get it into the brain quickly, that's going to be a much quicker psychedelic experience. So, so the trial that Small Pharma did, now Cybin company, um, with a high dose of DMT for severe depression, the results were extraordinary. So these are people who have maybe been depressed for 25, 30 years, who've tried lots of different medicines, uh, traditional SSRIs, most of them won't have worked. Well, they won't have worked, otherwise they wouldn't be um, kind of, their depression would not have got so severe. Um, that, so I think 50% of the people at going out to about three months um, were in remission. So an SSRI is not going to do that for you. Um, third of people at most, of all kinds of depression, so that's mild to moderate depression, um, will show remission on an SSRI. But people who are severely depressed, they were unlikely to work for them. Um, so the COMPASS Pathways trial, um, this is treatment resistant depression. So that's <coughs> clinically, people are clinically assessed as not responding to any of the antidepressants they've ever been given. And you might be looking at 30 years um, and they might have been on maybe their sixth antidepressant. Um, and there, so the remission rate there is 13% of people who will um, kind of recover. And psilocybin at the highest dose brought that up to 35%. Now that doesn't sound amazing, I mean, we're only 35% of people in the trial, but actually that is an extraordinary success rate. And also when you consider, back to your point about it being natural and how harmful things yeah. like SSRIs can be to Absolutely. you. Absolutely, yeah. And yeah. how dependent yeah. people become come to be yeah, on them. that's right. Which I, is not yeah. the case with, like you're saying, with yeah. things like DMT. It's not something Absolutely they have to take repeatedly. Not. No, no, no. So, but if anything, they are anti-dependent. So as I was saying about LSD and alcoholism, there's an awful lot of interest in treating drug addiction with psychedelics. Because of the way that they work, they, they <coughs> enable people to kind of face their trauma um, and, and kind of when you talk to people who've had the experience they do they go back into their past maybe uncover memories that they had buried because the natural response of your your brain for protection is to bury that the severe trauma and to not let you re-experience it but they enable you to face your perpetrator to and they reveal to you um, you know that I guess Many people blame themselves for, for their, their trauma. Um, even if it's sexual, physical abuse, they somehow kind of convince themselves that it was their fault, that maybe they deserved it in some way. There's a load of guilt for the things you have done. I guess if you're, uh, I guess for the military, for PTSD, the, there seems to be an awful lot of, 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 of guilt and, and that you survived and your best friends didn't. and. Uh, and I, yeah, thought, but I, I, it, it seems that the psychedelics enable people to really understand the root of their trauma and to kind of face it and in that way to recover. So it's, it's very much the, the opening of, of the brain, of the mind, I think you would say, um, to seeing things because your brain kind of constructs a narrative, I think, around your, for all of us, around your childhood, around any kind of trauma or things that weren't right about that. I know from my own perspective, uh, because I'm having uh, psychotherapy at the moment, um, really because I am struggling with anxiety and because of, um, I think, some family situation. Um, I would talk about small t as opposed to big t, so so no physical or sexual abuse or anything like that. But just because of the the kind of family situation. You um, mean small t trauma? Is that what you're yeah, talking about? Okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. And and I think I had constructed a narrative around my own childhood, actually that that wasn't correct, and it is taking psychotherapy to enable me to see that and understanding that 
and where then my behaviour has come from or where my anxiety has come from. That's extraordinary. It's been extraordinarily, you know, it's taken me, you know, to be 60 to, to get to this point. Um, yeah, it's enormously cathartic and it is amazingly healing. And I think that um, that's what the psychedelics do. And as David Nutt would say, that they do that in one day. You, know, you can have therapy for, for a year. I've just started, but you can have therapy for years or meditation and all those things that will be very beneficial for you. But a psychedelic has the ability to do that pretty much in 24 hours, which is extraordinary. I'm not saying that people don't still need to work on their mental health, um, but it, it gives them that that opening and that opportunity and the, the pharmacological effects are so extraordinary of these, uh, the, the cascade of events, the neuroplasticity, um, the rewiring of the brain, if you like, because we're, we're kind of all controlled by our default mode network. I mean, the brain is organized into um, neuronal networks. Um, that are interconnected. And the default mode network is kind of the top down control. Um, and it's very active in the resting state, which may explain why we wake in the middle of the night with our brains whirring around. You know, we're in that kind of resting state, and your default mode network is very, very active in that situation. And when people experience trauma and become unwell, that seems to become kind of hyperactive. <laughs> And the bit of the brain that we call the prefrontal cortex, so that's the, the you know, the cortical, the big cortex that, that um, kind of controls all our higher order functioning and processing, all your decision making and, and higher order cognitive ability and imagination and all that kind of, kind of stuff. That's all controlled by the cortex. Um, and that prefrontal cortex, all the uh, that controls a lot of this seems to be hyperactive in um, people with you know, severe depression and people with trauma. And what the psychedelics seem to do is they switch that off. So when you're in the experience, they've switched off that default mode network. With, and David Nutt describes it as the um, orchestra are allowed to play without the conductor. So the other networks in your brain that are kind of suppressed by the default mode network, by the fat controller, if you like, they are enabled to communicate with each other. And you're kind of brought back into that adolescent state. You've got that plasticity, that openness of your, your neural networks. And that's why people experience, have these uh, enormously kind of cathartic experiences. And of course, ego death. So the default mode network is the ego, it's I, uh, and we're all kind of self-obsessed, sadly, worryingly, uh, but it switches that off. And that's, I think, where it becomes terrifying because you kind of lose sense of who you are. But, but for severe trauma, that's what you need to heal. Um, you need to kind of get to that stage where you are, um, you have all this openness and you're kind of reborn in a way. But that's kind of partly that your brain is, is, is reborn as well. And it, it, it takes you back to that childhood. I mean, you, you, you know, you remember that, I mean, you see babies, don't you, and small kids, absolutely fascinated by kind of simple everyday objects. And wow, look at this, you know, this is amazing. Something that I've just picked up it kind of takes you to that as well. And that, uh, that sort of process enables the healing and then alongside all the integration. So what did you experience in your trip? Uh, talking about that and then trying to make sense of it and then taking your life forwards. Um, how you're going to make make the most of it, I guess, to heal. Yeah. It's such a difficult thing to describe without, if you're not able to talk on the science aspect of it. Yeah. So I, like the way I have had a few experiences handful but every single one has been positive as in I've, I've had something positive for it there's been aspects of at least one of them which were negative which were not yeah. pleasant yeah but the overall experience yeah. was positive I've taken something from it and 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 those things are usually really small yeah and it's it's 
I see it as perception. I feel like when I'm having an experience, I just feel like I've been picked up. And my, my point of view on the world, life, me, everything, is I've just been shifted half a yard to the left and it says, look at it again. And I'm, I feel like I'm looking at it in a different way. You look at something from a different angle, you see different things or it appears differently and, and, and you think different things about it because of your perception has changed. Yeah. And then if you talk about you know, what happens in the integration there, when you, when I, as you described it earlier with integration and, the, and the, thera, the therapeutic part afterwards, I think for me, my experience after, and I've not done anything controlled with you know, anything with heroic hearts or any of those, but afterwards, when I'm not under the influence, that alternative perception remains. It's like I've been nudged just slightly towards a better way of thinking, if yeah. you like. It's really marginal. The, the experience is very impactful when, you, when you're in it. Yeah. Like, un, unbelievable when you're in it. And that, depending what what are you under the influence of. And the, in, but in the real world, it's only a marginal change, I think, but very significant because you yeah. ch- as the way I understand it for me, it's just, it changes your consci- consciousness mm-hmm. on a really marginal level, which makes a huge difference because yeah. your consciousness is everything in your waking yeah. day. It's everything in your waking yeah. day. So it can have a huge impact. Really, Absolutely. every single one I've taken away something positive. Um, I mean, I think that's a lovely way to describe it, that it just nudges your perception uh, slightly. But that has an, has an enormous impact, just like you said, on your everyday existence, on your kind of your everyday the, how you experience the world, I think, and other people, um, and nature. I just, that seems to be absolutely extraordinary for people. And even people who've had a kind of a bad experience, um, a bad trip, if you like, they, talking to people, they come out of it ultimately with the same positive experience that you describe that they kind of their perception of the world, um, the world around them has kind of changed for the better. Mm. Or, or, your, or, your, or your perception of yourself. Yeah. Some of yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And um, that's, that's so valuable. Clearly, it's not for everybody. Um, there are definitely people, you know, the clinical trials are very, very careful to not bring anyone into a trial um, with the <clears throat> risk of psychosis, family history, um, and of certain personality disorders. Some, there's some, um, really some people who, who it's unlikely to be benefit. It's, it's very difficult, I think, because it is such a, such a healing experience for people. You don't want to deny it to anybody but you don't want to make somebody's psychological situation worse and their mental health worse. And I think it's about identifying people who it will help and people who it won't. Mm. Um, And that will be one of the challenges going forward. There are clearly a lot of challenging um, challenges, I think, for the field. Um, You know, changing the law is, is kind of not the least of those, but we have changed the law in Australia. So in Australia, psilocybin is legal for the treatment of um, uh, severe depression now, and ecstasy is legal for the treatment of PTSD. And actually the, the MAPS trial results, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies in the States, of course, they're kind of worldwide now, sort of first established by Rick Doblin in the 86, I think it was. So he has been fighting forever um, to treat, to be allowed to treat people with psychedelics. Um, and their focus is ecstasy, MDMA for PTSD. And now the FDA, so the Federal Drugs Administration, Food and Drug Administration in the States, is same as our MHRA, are considering um, all the evidence that MDMA should be a medicine. And we're expecting an outcome at the end of this year. I mean, they work pretty slowly. But, but there have been two very large trials um, run by MAPS in the States MDMA for PTSD, three treatments with MDMA. Um, and for people with moderate to severe PTSD, lots of those people have been uh, combat veterans, first responders. And the first trial, um, I think 67% of people at 
I think eight months post-treatment, it's a long time since po post-treatment, no longer met the criteria for having PTSD. Wow. Extraordinary. And there were 90 people in that trial. So that, for a psychedelic, that's a big trial. The second trial has just read out over 100 people, even better results. I think 85% of people who got MDMA um, became uh, clinically better and 70% of those no longer met the criteria for PTSD. Wow. I mean, that's extraordinary. We can't do that with anything else. We can't do that with we an need SSRI. It, we need it, yeah, so bad. We can't I do that so with the MDR. People. So many people. So many people with, with PTSD yeah. who nothing is working for them. No. Nothing is working for them. No. And they're either managing to get through life just in, in extreme misery yeah. or they're at the end of their life because of substance abuse or something yeah. like that. Yeah. And is they've they've literally exhausted all, all the options yeah. to them have been exhausted in the UK and there's nothing and it's so frustrating when it, you, we know there's things out there that they can try that can help. There's so many things. Yeah. You know, you just talk about MDMA there, it's just yeah. one aspect of the yeah. you know, the of the, of the, of psychedelics. the psychedelic spectrum. And it's like can't be done because Ketamine. fucking things are really part of my language, you're illegal over here yeah. and, and they did yeah, yeah. you shouldn't be. Because yeah. it stifles everything from the research to yeah. the treatment. Yeah, yeah. Well talk to me about the research. Having them in schedule one of the misuse of drugs regulations. Yeah makes it extremely difficult to do research. Uh, we have, uh, you know, uh, NHS trusts and universities have research exempt for sure anything that's in Schedule 2 and, and below that. <coughs> so you're talking about all other currently illegal drugs. So ketamine, heroin, cocaine, amphetamine, um, yeah, um, all those, you know, anything else that potentially far more harmful than a psychedelic, they're all in schedule two because they have a medical benefit. Well, psychedelics, we know they have a medical benefit. How many clinical trials have now been conducted? Government are still refusing to, to, <sighs> to reschedule. They are working on exemptions to research, so giving us research exemptions um, for anybody who wants to do research. I know they're working very hard on that now. ACMD have recommended a load of exemptions. That came out on the 22nd of December, um, so the, just the, the other week. legalisation of cannabis may be the first domino at least to fall, right? That's the most likely one to be, I know you don't think it's psychedelic, but this is the most likely current Schedule 1 drug that is most likely to be legalised soon, right? I mean, the police don't care at the minute. I mean, aha, uh -huh. well, the police have decriminalised, haven't they? Because why would you arrest people who just haven't, yeah. well, police haven't got the manpower or the resources to be arresting people for using a drug that's causing no harm to society. Zero harm, Zero while, harm. while alcohol is legal. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So they're so busy. <laughs> madness. <laughs> scooping it's up madness. people out of gutters. There's you know, still like. such a stigma around it and the other things. It how it causes makes... schizophrenia and you, oh my God. Oh my oh, God. I mean oh. that. Stop listening to your grandparents. <laughs> and really, you know, get your cannabis from somewhere that isn't going to sell you skunk, which is 99% THC, which is not good for anybody. You know, that really is, and that we would never be dealing with a situation where most of the cannabis you're going to buy, unless you really know what you're doing, is, is very high THC. And that is a problem, but that is in, you've talked to Neil Woods, that is in the, in the interests of organised crime, um, because that's the highly psychoactive mm. component, and that's the bit that people will become dependent on. So if we're all using cannabis that has a high proportion of CBD, which is legal, uh, with your THC, as, and of course, cannabis is legal as a medicine and has been legal since November 2018. Still prescription, nobody, right? prescription, yeah. still nobody can access it. There, there have been less than 20 NHS prescriptions in, what, four, four five years um, for cannabis, really? for medical cannabis, yeah. You cannot get it on the NHS. I know someone who's got a, I'm beginning to think he's lying. I know someone who's got a prescription for medical cannabis. Well, you can get, oh, you can get but a private prescription, oh, cost you 20,000 okay. a year. Okay. Or you can go to Project 2021, Drug Sciences Project 2021. They've got at least three and a half thousand people enrolled on their clinical trial now. That's a way to get medical cannabis, still going to cost you money. So. NHS, you go to your GP, medical cannabis, this is why for pain, I mean chronic pain is one of the, the main indications of Project 2021, for anxiety, for depression, 
um, you know, for a range of, of disorders. Your GP isn't qualified to prescribe it. He's going to have to refer you to a specialist, somebody on the specialist register. There aren't that many of, of you know, psychiatrists out there because there isn't, you know, the training hasn't been provided. So government legalised with no mechanism for anybody to access this on the NHS. But the same GP child, can, can prescribe, sorry, the same GP can prescribe an antidepressant here. Oh, yeah, no problem. <laughs> And it's wild, isn't it? It's wild. It's wild. It's sad, and it's frustrating, and it's massively, I'm massively angry about the whole situation. It's so wrong, and it's just not helping anybody. It's heartbreaking. Uh, um, yeah, we've got a few minutes left. Um, well, so on on that situation, I'm happy with. How can people? How can People help move us forward to a situation. Write where... your MP. Okay. Uh, we need to reschedule psychedelics as quickly as possible so that people can get on with the research. We do need more clinical trials. We need more information. I'm, you know, for any new chemical entity coming onto the market, there will have been extensive receptor pharmacology done on 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 that medicine. I'm not. So these are plant medicines. I haven't seen enough uh, in-depth um, pharmacology done on the psychedelics um, that I am completely comfortable. I think, especially if people are going to microdose, because the, how selective are they for the 2A receptor cortex? That's all going to produce you know, the effects that you want. But don't forget, there's a lot of 5-HT sitting around in the periphery, and that controls blood pressure, it controls heart, it, uh, platelets, you know. Um, so gut function. Um, so what, what we're concerned about, I think, are off-target effects. So, and, but again, within the 5-HT system, so the, the so they work on the 5-HT2A receptor, but they also work on 5-HT2B receptors, 2C receptors. 2B receptors are located on the heart valves. So if people, and I, you know, I think we're not concerned about a clinical trial where people are only taking two or three you know, high doses under medical supervision. They'll have been very, very carefully screened. But for people who, who are microdosing, who are using... Uh, psychedelics much more frequently in countries where this is legal. I think we need to have a better understanding of long-term effects if you're taking them, you know, with microdosing a month at a time, a month <coughs> off, a month on, and people will take them for years. Um, I think we need a lot more information on the, t the potential toxicology. We know, I mean, we've done quite a lot of research trawling the literature for adverse effects. Clearly, there's in, an increase in blood pressure, and that's the 2A effect on the um, on um, smooth muscle of the blood vessel. So you do get a vasoconstriction. You do get increase in blood pressure, an increase in heart rate. We're all going to get that when we use a psychedelic, but that's going to be very short lived. And you know, if you're healthy, if you've no underlying conditions, no underlying cardiovascular pathology, then you know, should be no no problem. And we could not find hardly any evidence of hospitalization in all the trials that have been published and all the um, where you can find information about retreat centers and people taking psychedelics case reports couldn't find um, you know any evidence of there being particular problem there but what about um, valve damage if you're taking the heart valve damage if you're taking these for a long long time so we do need more tox studies done that'll be done in, in animals um, we do need more in-depth receptor pharmacology because we really want to know how selective these these drugs are for the 2A over the 2B, 2C, 5HT4 receptors, for example. If you have cardiac pathology, you will have an upregulation of these receptors. Normal people people won't have. I think we really need to identify who is got likely to respond well and who should not um, uh, who should not be be taking psychedelics. That'll be very very helpful. Um, we will need an awful lot of funding, we will need more training, we will need more specialists because again, this will be approved as a medicine, it has to be, the, ev the clinical evidence is so impressive, the need is so great. Uh, as you say, you know so many people with PTSD, we know so many people dying of addiction every day 
And that's one disorder that absolutely breaks my heart, people who... Look at Matthew Perry. You know, the... Just the, the tragic... I mean, how much did he say he spent on therapy and um, rehab? You know, millions. Um, and we still couldn't help him. Um, yeah, so, so the need is so great that this, this has to come into clinical practice. But we will need men, it will be again probably specialist registers. So, and again, this is something that you have to go to a clinic to, to receive. And we want people to be in long enough and to have enough integration and to be looked after carefully. And we don't want telehealth like they have started in America with ketamine. I mean, ketamine is a, again, induces a very profound psychological experience. And people are being given it to take at home. Mm. I don't think that is safe. I don't think that's the right way forward. We need to make sure that we have enough funding and facilities and trained personnel to deliver safe, effective psychedelic therapy. And then we will save lives. And we know we can save lives this way. So we need, you know, the, the funders, um, we need the government to to understand that this needs to happen, um, but that it must be um, not like they legalized cannabis, but had no mechanism of anybody receiving it without paying. Otherwise, private clinics will, you know, they will um, flourish. And that will mean that you and I can't get it, that, that normal people who've got normal cannot, um, cannot access meds. That's not the way we want to do this. This must be available on the NHS for people who need it. So we need government, we need NHS funding. And this will save money in the long run, though. This will save an awful lot of money. So when people write to MP, what are they say? They say, um, look at the evidence for the beneficial effects of psychedelic and support rescheduling. And um, yeah, let's, well, one, reschedule psilocybin to enable research uh, and reform the Misuse of Drugs Act as well. Let's see a complete overhaul of that. Um, let's reform our drug laws. Write your MPs, folks. Write yeah. your MPs. I yeah, certainly yeah. will do. Because yeah. uh, who else? May, I think, do you know what? Tara mentioned it to me. Yeah, and I still haven't done it. I will do there it. Are, I will, there are sure. templates from various organisations that you can Perfect. get to, to write to your MPs. Perfect. Um, um, and support psychedelic medicine in the right way. Yeah. Uh, Okay, lastly, you've got your own podcast, right? Drug Science Podcast. Uh -huh. Go on, yes, tell people have. about it, please. So for people who don't know what drug science is, it's <clears> the UK's <throat> leading independent organisation providing information, evidence-based information about drugs. So that's the drugs, that, kind of drugs that we've been talking about, drugs that are currently illegal, um, but legal drugs like alcohol and nicotine. Um, vaping, actually, that's a very hot topic. So it was set up by David Nutt, who was the drugs advisor to the government until he wanted to uh, downregulate ecstasy and LSD and went on television talking about that. Was sacked by Alan Johnson, who was the Home Secretary at that time. For talking about it. For talking about wow. it, for, for, you know, for providing evidence, uh, for wanting an evidence-based drug policy. So he set up his own charity, Drug Science is a Charity, um, and that has been running for about 12 years. So we, one of, I chair the Medical Psychedelics Working Group, there's a Medical Cannabis Working Group, and a Harm Reduction Working Group, which is all about um, enabling people to keep safe. People who use drugs, enabling them to, to keep safe. Things like um, drug consumption rooms or safe injection facilities. So people who use heroin, or, or other drugs that they inject, have a safe place um, to use their drug rather than sitting under a bridge and, and potentially overdosing and, you know, in the cold and the dark, miserable. So that's a no-brainer, and that has been shown to save lives. Um, heroin-assisted therapy for people who I know heroin, people so. are listening to this who haven't listened to the Neil, Ep Neil Woods episode and saying, what? That's a ridiculous idea. <laughs> it is not a ridiculous idea. Trust me, go back and listen to the Neil Woods episode. But just think about it. <laughs> think yeah. about it from your own perspective. If you're going, if you're a heroin user, um, and I'm, at least you hopefully should be able to get, you know, a clean needle and a syringe, um, 
but how chaotic your life must be if you know this is a medicine you need to keep you well and if you're not rich your your life is in the hands of organized crime and you do not know what you're buying you do not know what you're injecting into your veins it is not safe to be living on the streets it is not safe to be injecting something that you you have no way of verifying what it is heroin assisted treatment goes a stage further than a safe um, injection facility so you go to a safe place and and the ones that have been trialed in the uk have been in gp surgery where there's also psychological support so you get a clean dose of the drug that you need to keep you well at this moment in time um it's in a nice environment and you get psychological support and you get help with your benefits help with housing it's it's and no, that is going to completely it's the opposite. change your life. It's the opposite of a gateway drug. It's the gateway off. Yeah, it's like that's the first that's step. Right. It's the opposite yeah. of a gateway drug. It's yeah. the gateway. It's the, yeah. the first step on the path to getting away from it. So if you're writing to your MP, ask yeah. them to support heroin-assisted treatment and safe injection facilities for people. Yeah. It's the minimum we can do to support people and to help them and to keep them safe. People yeah. are unfortunate. Most people who use drugs... Um, or misuse or drugs um, have had significant trauma in their lives and have probably had a horrible upbringing and nobody to support them. We must support those support people. Yeah. Joe, I really enjoyed today. Thank you Me very too. much for your time. And uh, we should definitely do it again. Definitely do Love it again. Love to. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Let's do it. Thanks a lot. And keep doing what you're doing. Good luck. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. Loved it.